Yeah, so hi everybody. Thanks a lot for dialing in today. We have about one hour to chat with uh, Neil and Mark about their new book, Fundamentals of Software Architecture. Um, there's basically just one logistic thing to keep in mind. Exactly, that's the book. So if you're not here for that, then... <laughs> um, uh, so I will have an eye on the Q&A. So if you want to ask a question, then please make sure to uh, ask it in the Q&A because uh, the chat is probably going to be a bit more noisy. So I won't be able to keep tabs on that. And then I'll try to um, consolidate some of the questions and, uh, and bring them up with Neil and uh, Mark. And I'll start us off with some more general questions. And um, maybe just to quickly introduce myself, uh, my name is Brigitte Böckler. I'm a technical principal with uh, ThoughtWorks, same company as Neil, actually. Um, so I'm a developer by trade, but of course, you know, the longer you do the job, the more and more situations you get in where you also call yourself an architect, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm uh, familiar with the topic at hand and uh, yeah, excited to uh, talk about this book. And um, Mark and Neil are both uh, hands-on architects and pr practitioners, but also very prolific authors and speakers on the topic of software architecture. And maybe we can start off by the two of you maybe also briefly introducing yourselves a bit more. And maybe you can also already go a bit into like what, uh, what in your experience brought you to the point where you were like, ah, I need to write a book on the fundamentals of software architecture in 2020. And there are probably already quite a few out there, right? So I'll start the introductions and I'll let Mark introduce himself and then give, give, start that answer because I'm sure it's multifaceted. Uh, my name is uh, Neil Ford. I'm a, a director, software architect, and meme wrangler at uh, ThoughtWorks, uh, uh, where Brigitte also works. Uh, she and I actually uh, uh, helped put together the uh, technology radar last week over a Zoom call for most of the week. Um, and uh, I've been with ThoughtWorks uh, just over 15 years now, uh, and I've been in a role of uh, various kinds of architecture uh, during my time at ThoughtWorks and I've been focusing a lot of time over the last few years over the intersection of agile engineering practices and software architecture. Uh, my penultimate book was uh, Building Evolution Architectures and now Mark and I have written a Fundamentals of Software Architecture, uh, which turns out are uh, pretty closely related. Indeed. And um, so my name is Mark Richards. So you can associate the, the face. There we go. Yes, there's the, uh, the book. Um, and I'm an independent consultant and also uh, like Neil, a hands-on software architect. Um, been in the industry for uh, oh, almost close to 35 years now, I guess, uh, 25 of those as an architect. Um, my primary focus uh, in the past six years has primarily been around microservices and that has been helping companies move uh, from monolithic applications over to microservices, but also greenfield applications as well. So uh, lots, of, uh, lots of excitement in the past six years. As a matter of fact, it's probably the hardest six years <laughs> in my career so far. <laughs> Um, but Neil and I have uh, known each other. I know this guy. Well, actually, he's over here, um, depending on what. <laughs> yeah, there he is. <laughs> I've, known, I've known this guy here for uh, close to, I guess, what, Neil, about 15 years um, from uh, speaking on the um, NFJS, the No Fluff, Just Stuff tour that uh, we started back in 2014, I think, uh, 20, uh, 2003, I should say. That was the first time. But uh, so, so Neil and I have known each other since then and started collaborating on some ideas about, gee, um, there's no real concise place where anybody can kind of go for software architecture. Um, both Neil and I had been doing uh, quite a few talks, as a matter of fact, on the NFGS tour, as well as other kinds of conferences on the topics of software architecture, but it was, it was, it was all very piecemeal. So Neil and I were together um, one time, um, actually on vacation together, and um, Neil said, you know, we got to put all this knowledge and information together into one concise uh, narrative arc about software architecture. Whew, what was that, Neil? About seven years ago, I think, right? At least, yeah. Yeah, at least seven years ago. And so um, from there, we, uh, we created a, a video, which we recorded um, uh, through O'Reilly, and then consequently, the book. But um, <clears throat> um, Birgitta, you'd mentioned about uh, the question, you know, why yet another software architecture book? There are so many out there. Um, why create another 422-page book about architecture? And uh, there's many, many reasons for that. But um, one of the primary ones was just 
that throughout the years, um, we have various axioms that we really kind of think about in software architecture. And, um, and an axiom is something that uh, we believe is a kind of a statement or a proposition that we believe is kind of self-evidently true. And, and this is what mathematics is really built upon, are these axioms. Uh, for example, that you can draw a straight line from any point to any other point. And this is a basic axiom in mathematics. Um, we have a lot of axioms in software architecture, but what Neil and I started to observe is that a lot of these axioms um, aren't quite valid today. So that was one of the drivers of a book. As a matter of fact, I think, Neil, you say, what, about every 10 years, this should probably come out, or maybe even more. <laughs> and th this is actually how it's related to the evolutionary architecture world, because as we were delving into that world, we realized that one of the fundamental characteristics of the software development ecosystem is this constant, very minor, but incremental change, chaotically, you know, always constantly yeah. changing a little bit, where the end result of that, so... One of the, the roles that I used to have was conference co-chair for the O'Reilly Software Architecture Conference. And at the end of every one of those conferences, the O'Reilly marketing people would come to me and say, hey, Neil, what's going to be the next big thing in software architecture next year? And I always said, I have no idea. Because the way that's going to come about is one small change will trigger another small change, will trigger another small change. And after that happens, you know, 3,000 times, you have a completely new ecosystem. So that's why I believe that every 10 years, you should really go back and rethink the ecosystem. So part of our premise of this book was, what if you invented software architecture today, not with 20 years of baggage and legacy thinking about software architecture? What if it were a new pursuit today, given what we know about engineering practices and containers and clouds and all that stuff, how would you approach software architecture differently? And a good example of one of those axioms that we sort of invalidated was the scope of what uh, people call, we call architecture characteristics, also non-functional requirements or cross-cutting requirements, uh, cross-cutting concerns. Uh, the scope of those things has always forever been assumed to be at the system level, but very often that's no longer true. And in fact, we give some concrete examples in our book of architecture problems where you can't, uh, you, you need to narrow the scope of, of the architecture characteristics, but once you do that, that opens up a whole new way of thinking about how you go from that step forward in building the rest of the architecture. So how timeless do you think this book will be? Or like, did you have like a target in mind, like for how many years you would want it to be valid? Or I guess there's always a balance to strike because you give a lot of practical advice and also point to tools and stuff like that. And they always evolve, right? And so, but you probably had something in mind, right? Like in terms of the abstraction level, how timeless you wanted it to be? So it always takes so long to write a book. Our goal is always at least five and maybe 10 years. And so maybe this will last 10 years. I'm hoping someone in exactly 10 years from now will go, hey, this one has just now today become out of date for the first time. <laughs> and so now we need to write a new one that addresses the entirely new ecosystem we find ourselves in. But I mean, there are some of these problems that I think, you know, especially in such a young engineering discipline as, as software development, because everything, all of our capabilities, our targets are changing, everything is in constant flux. You really do need to revisit some fundamental ideas on a regular basis until you get some actual axioms that you can rely on for, you know, time immemorial. And uh, we have very few of those in the software world right now, mm, and right. even fewer in architecture. I guess the flip side of that is that there are so many really good uh, ideas from like the 60s and 70s that kind of came out of date, right? And we, we should have maybe uh, stuck with them a bit longer and then we're rediscovering them in the 2000s, right? <laughs> well, and you know, the, a lot of this is the, you know, the, the search for silver bullets. So one of the things that we did in the book in the first section really we did dive deeply into architecture characteristics and analysis. And one of the things we did was went back to both the uh, 70s and the 80s and the 90s and looked at some of the metrics that were developed for architectures at that time. Those are still perfectly valid metrics, but they're not, you know, these magic silver bullets. And so because they're not super comprehensive, people leave them aside, but they're still very useful for very narrow kinds of analysis. And, you know, one of the things that impedes us from becoming a true engineering discipline, I think, is having good measurement tools and good repeatability. So, you know, when we can find objective measurement tools, we, we, we like it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, well, so I was surprised to see uh, mathematical formulas in a, in a book about architecture and maybe, um, uh, yeah, that leads us a bit to the question, like you have one part of the book where you talk a lot about these, these metrics, for example, how do you measure coupling and stuff like that and what, what the tools and metrics are. And um, 
when I was reading that, I was thinking that uh, a lot of people often get confused, like where's the line between design and architecture, right? So some people might think, oh, isn't that design work that, that I'm doing? Like, uh, you know, where does it become architecture? Can you maybe talk a bit about that distinction and how you yeah. uh, walk that line? <laughs> Absolutely, because this is um, one of the things I'm really passionate about, and that is another um, kind of invalid axiom. Um, you see, one of the things that um, we tend to slip into believing is basically that software architecture is really a separate activity from software development. And um, that, in fact, is today an invalid axiom. Um, software uh, building software systems, I say, uh, I should say, requires um, a really tight, continuous collaboration between the activities an architect does and the activities a software developer does. Um, yeah, it's a question I get a lot in my trainings, also at various clients about, you know, where does kind of architecture end and like design and development begin? And uh, really the question is, it doesn't. It kind of forms a continuous loop um, and this is absolutely necessary today. We describe this in our book um, from uh, the fact of more the process of architecture as opposed to actually the foundational structures of architecture. In uh, the fact that as an architect, we, um, well, we had determined the architectural characteristics and try to extract those from business drivers. We build and define components within the architecture. We also decide on the architecture styles, whether it's going to be microservices or event-driven or maybe space-based or a combination of all three. <laughs> and we generate artifacts out of these. And one of the invalid axioms that we still have, unfortunately, in practice at a lot of large organizations is that we take these artifacts as an architect and we throw them across the wall over to development teams to then start designing components and, and figuring out class diagrams and mm, source code and UI design and, and such. And uh, the problem is the hapless architect uh, walks away going, that was a really good job. And they have no idea about whether that is actually a correct um, architecture or not. And so uh, the point is uh, with this uh, kind of invalid axiom, uh, does require um, a very tight collaboration between the software architect and the development teams uh, to continually throughout the entire lifespan of the project um, to continually software architect or software developers, for example, um, validate our architectures and changes in the way we implement things and learn more about that, then feed back into changes in the architecture, which then circle around and feed back into the development teams. And this tight collaboration um, is really what's required in uh, software architecture today. So it's a good example of another um, invalid axiom that we um, talked about quite a bit um, uh, or talk about quite a bit in the book. Mm -hmm. And it, it's uh, your, your specific question is a great example of very often, a lot of those kind of clean code kind of concerns are generally tech lead down. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that we talk about are what we call implicit architectural characteristics, which are ones that are not written down on a requirements document or story card anywhere, but you should uh, try to achieve as an architect. Because no one's ever going to give you a story card that says, please don't screw up the internal modularity of the code base you're designing. <laughs> But that should be one of your goals as an architect because you don't want a system that you architect to limp to the finish line and you can't maintain it, you can't enhance it, you can't move it, you can't do anything with it. And so that's when concerns about some of these low level code metrics become architectural concerns. And they may influence the tech lead to be more diligent about cycle net complexity and some of the coupling metrics and some of those kind of things. And that's where architecture really needs to influence design. At the same time, we also make an argument about architects over specifying things. Uh, for, for example, communications in distributed architectures. We're increasingly saying, and I'm actually carrying the flag harder than, than, than the two of us right now on this, I'm still working on Mark, but he's slowly coming around, that uh, architects really should just say synchronous versus asynchronous for communication. Everything else is an implementation detail because that's the architectural concern is that because that has a real impact on these operational architecture characteristics because synchronous calls make things, uh, architectures less reliable, but are sometimes necessary for transactional behavior and those kind of behaviors. And so I think some of those decisions should actually be relegated at a lower level. Like, okay, we want it to be synchronous. Let the tech lead decide what style of synchronous communication as long as it meets the fitness functions and the SLAs we set in place for, for that. So uh, it's actually both, 
more detailed than you normally get in architecture and less detailed than what you normally get in architecture. So. <laughs> So maybe you can start diving a bit into what's actually in the book so people know what to expect. So, and um, one of the things that you start off with and that, that, um, that I really liked, uh, both of those is two laws of software architecture. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so especially like the second one, but please uh, start with the first one and tell people what it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the um, first law of software architecture that uh, Neil and I identified, as a matter of fact, at the very beginning of the book, which kind of drives the theme throughout um, pretty much every chapter um, is that uh, everything in software architecture is a trade-off. And that really is the first law that we identified. Um, uh, we did, of course, uh, uh, define a second law as well, but um, let's talk about the first law uh, a little bit because um, this has created uh, quite a bit of uh, controversy lately, as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, with this first law. Um, everything in software architecture is in fact a trade-off. And what this does lead to is an interpretation that I put on this, that in fact, there are no best practices in software architecture. Best practices. Best practices. <laughs> um, what's the best practice? Um, async or um, synchronous? It depends. And this is why that big joke that um, came out um, quite some time ago about uh, if you ask any architect any question, they will always answer, it depends. Because it's everything we design is based on some sort of context. And um, I was um, recently speaking on, in February, as a matter of fact, in a keynote um, uh, related to the book, and I mentioned this invalid axiom that there are no best practices or that we shouldn't follow them. Um, and it did actually, um, uh, create quite a quite a stir in on um, social media, and I, yeah, I think you're referring really... to this uh, Twitter thread that uh, Grady Booch started, right? Quite a big name actually in the history of software architecture. Yeah, and yeah. so you know, arguing that there are actually best practices. For example, that you need to do trade-offs, right? And yes, yeah. exactly. And um, I flippantly had, uh, mentioned that that was very meta because, <laughs> of course, that defines wide. But um, I really wanted to talk about this because it gives me a chance now to kind of qualify. Um, this um, um, mis not misunderstanding, but just maybe disagreements or uh, controversy about, wait a minute, there are some best practices. Um, and, and here's where I like the dividing line occurring. Um, um, admittedly, um, well, uh, let me start uh, at, the, at the basics. Um, when we talk about software architecture, um, there really are two things to talk about. Uh, there's software architecture as the foundational structure of the system and actually how we design computer systems and software systems. But then there's also another aspect of software architecture, which is the process of software architecture or architecting a system. And this involves a process of actually being uh, the role of a software architect. Um, thinking about those two divisions of software architecture, uh, admittedly, and I will fully say that in the process of software architecture, there are certainly those kind of practices that we absolutely should follow. And I would just fight those to the death. Um, and you could call those best practices maybe. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one that um, uh, Grady Bush correctly pointed out that a best practice is to always analyze a trade-off or find the trade-offs. Another best practice is when we're trying to identify the architectural characteristics of a particular system, and those are those illities. Um, we as an architect try to identify and extract as many of those as we can, um, but we as an architect can't make the decision of which is more important, performance or availability. And so there's a tight collaboration that's required with business stakeholders, whether it be the product owner or another kind of business stakeholder, to say what is important for you orthogonally to the functionality of this system. And that is essentially, or that is essential uh, to the process of architecture. However, when we turn to the foundational structure of a system, in terms of what um, Neil was talking about, about async versus synchronous communication, or whether to use microservices as the structure, um, structurally, I still and will always maintain uh, that there is no best practice in the structural aspects and the foundational structures of our software systems. Um, as a matter of fact, you may as go as far as to say, well, wait a minute, loose coupling. Um, we, that's a best practice. Uh, however, there is a trade-off 
to loose coupling. And we try to strive, for example, for loose coupling uh, between components or services, but the more we separate out concerns, for example, applying the law of Demeter, for example, uh, D-E-M-E-T-E-R, the law of Demeter, uh, which is the principle of least knowledge. Um, this is a way to create decoupled systems, but the point is we start losing various aspects like transactionality, workflow, uh, these, these sort of coordination of a business transaction. And so there are even trade-offs in such things as saying we need to strive for loose coupling. And so um, when we talk about the structure, I think that's where a good division and a good understanding of where Neil and I came up with this first law of software architecture. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah, I think in the, building, in the Building Evolutionary Architectures book that Neil also co-authored, you call it appropriate coupling, right? That's like appropriate is a good word, I think, or yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, one of the examples we give in the book of exactly one of these trade-offs is, okay, I have this uh, shared class that I need to use between two services. What should I do with that? Functionally, it needs to be shared. Should I create a coupling point to it or should I duplicate it? Well, the answer, of course, is it depends. But in this case, it depends on, are you in a distributed architecture like microservices, which really values decoupling very highly? In that case, the correct answer is more likely duplicate it. Whereas if you're in a modular monolith where uh, that kind of coupling is much easier and has fewer consequences, the correct answer might be, uh, let's share it. And so, you know, it's always contextual, uh, which kind of leads to the first corollary to the first law of software architecture, oh, yes. which is, uh, if you think you found something in software architecture, that's not a trade off, it just means you haven't discovered the trade off yet, because it's always <laughs> there. And there are lots of examples of these that we, for decades, thought were purely good things in software architecture that we gradually realized, wait, now that's a terrible idea. We shouldn't do that anymore. And you actually see that reflected in the designs that we create over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So do you want to go ahead and do the second law, Mark? Sure, I will start it. You Maybe I just wanted to give people like just a quick pointer. So uh, kind of taking off from this uh, uh, law that there's always trade-offs, like you have one part of the book where you go through the most common uh, uh, architecture styles and even have like uh, uh, you show the different trade-offs kind of with star ratings, right? The trade-offs between deployability, elasticity, evolutionary, evolutionarity, being evolutionary, right? Performance and so on. So it's like a nice overview to have like the most common styles and then you can maybe see, okay, what are your requirements and then uh, balance that just to give people some pointer how, how then concretely you're picking that up in the book. So that was the first law about trade-offs. And our second law, please. Well, before that, I wanted to, to address what you said. One of the things that we discovered, so we, we built this book very iteratively because when we first joined all my, our material together, like Mark was talking about, uh, it didn't have a really good firm story because it was you know, kind of a lot of stuff. But over time, we kind of narrowed it and figured out. And that's one of the things that we figured out by teaching this material a lot is you, you really want to get down at some point to an apples to apples comparison between all these different architectures across all these different dimensions. And so that was the inspiration for creating that kind of matrix of capabilities at the end of every chapter. So that you do have a way of kind of apples to apples comparing those things. Yeah. Well, you can go and count those stars and then there's going to be one with the most stars. I guess that's the best one, right? <laughs> that's trying to do architect math. And that, that doesn't work. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, but what we, is your second law of software architecture? The, the um, second law um, of software architecture is actually an epiphany of mine um, back in 2011. And the second law of software architecture in a book states that the why is more important than the how. And that was an epiphany that I had when I was trying to, uh, as an architect, to really understand why things were done. You know, when we have diagrams and think about documenting architecture, I can see a diagram. I can see how things connect and how the flow works. But what I don't understand and what I really want to understand in architecture is why you chose to use a messaging call instead of a RESTful call. Why you chose to break this service up into four pieces instead of one and orchestrate it. Um, all these why questions, suddenly Neil and I both realized um, this this is the critical um, important aspect of architecture. Um, and so we devoted an entire chapter, as a matter of fact, chapter 19 of the book on architecture decisions and specifically um, Michael Nygaard's architecture decision records, um, which mm, he did actually, I believe um, came out in 2011 when my epiphany happened. As soon as I saw those, I'm like, oh, this is a great way to record these. And I realized, oh, and I can record the justification of why I made a decision 
in the decision part of an architecture decision record. As a matter of fact, uh, the epiphany um, uh, Birgitta just continues and continues with that. And I, I talk about these a lot in that chapter um, 19, which is architecture decisions. Yeah, yeah like I, um, I always say that, that, you know, when it comes to documentation, for example, like the current state of the system, that's what everybody's documenting, right? All the boxes and this is what the system looks like. Like if I have to, if somebody, if somebody throws me a piece of software over the fence, I can go into the code and I can create that diagram, right? But all that history, like why it is what it is, that if that's not written down, then I cannot reproduce it, right? So, but that's actually the thing that we don't, yes. that we don't write down. And I always wonder, like, what is that bias or what is that psychological thing that keeps us from doing it? Because even though... Uh, I always like uh, talk about how important it is and I try to do it as much as possible. I constantly catch myself not doing it and I constantly see the discipline waning. And I wonder if it is that we're just so happy when we take a decision, we just wanna, you know, just go ahead and implement it. Like, I don't know if you have any good practice well, uh, how to like keep up the discipline of recording decisions and recording the history and the whys. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, you know, getting in the habit of creating ADRs anytime you, anytime you spent more than an hour researching something, you should start up, stay or start an ADR because you're going to eventually fill it out because you spent some time doing it. I mean, the, the real epiphany for us about that second law was, you know, we, uh, when Mark and I do these uh, hands-on workshops, we do the architecture cottage and have people design architectures. And for a while we thought, oh, we'll capture catalog of all these solutions and build this big catalog of solutions. And then after we gathered a bunch of them, we realized that they were essentially useless because we were capturing how they solved the problem, but not why they had made these critical decisions at one point or another. And, and getting directly to your question, uh, Brigida, I think uh, once we've made a decision like that, I think it's na human nature to think, oh man, I've solved that problem forever. I'm never gonna have to look at that again, that's done. Just put a nail in that and move on. And of course, you know, how many times have you in a system uh, gone and looked at something and gone, oh, what idiot made this? Oh, that was me eight and a half months ago. Okay, well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, there were also some, some questions in the chat, like about how do you record them, any specific tools or like, and then there's a whole chapter in the book about, uh, you even reference some tools and also a good structure and what to look after in the structure and, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, th I believe it's chapter 19, uh, Architecture Decisions, um, really um, takes a deep dive into um, ADRs, Architecture Decision Records, um, how to uh, leverage uh, those sections um, in an ADR, how to enhance those sections, um, how to communicate uh, those decisions and how to store those. That's all kind of covered in the book. But I will say, quite interestingly enough, um, it does relate also to the first law of software architecture because everything, even architecture decision records uh, are a trade-off. Um, I happen to just uh, think this is, uh, ADRs are the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, and and you'll, 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 you'll see that in the excitement of my writing of that chapter. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, they do admittedly require uh, a level of governance um, to make sure that uh, if you're going to embrace architecture decision records as a means of recording and documenting a your architecture, but also your decisions, uh, your consequences, all this, um, it does require governance and discipline to make sure that all of those decisions are encapsulated within ADRs. And so that is kind of a, I guess I would call that a trade-off of ADRs is that they are um, uh, something that I would not recommend just sort of using for a few things and then huge architecture documents for another. Uh, it would create a lot of disparity, confusion, and I have no idea where to go to find out the why anymore. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. but I, I think it would probably be a 99%, 1% trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, but two, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there were... Um, I don't, did, did you want to talk more about this topic or otherwise I would move on to... to uh, just one more minute, uh, just to really briefly say that um, an ADR is, is really quite simply just a, um, a one to two page text file. Um, usually I, I write them in ASCII doc or, or Markdown um, and they're usually stored in a Git repo uh, along with the code, although I actually prefer to extract those out because not everybody has access to a Git repo. Um, no. um, but uh, there's some discipline in terms of where they're stored, like for example, in a wiki, um, which is where I love to store them. Uh, each page represents an architecture decision record, 
or and uh, as you a could search have a, function and it has search and metadata as well yeah so uh, a lot of features but it doesn't require um really any sort of sophisticated tooling other than some sort of markdown language and a wiki <laughs> as a matter of fact if you don't have those please write an adr and notepad and store them on a file system <laughs> uh, simple and short is actually a feature not a bug for adrs that's correct yes yeah yeah, so um, I, I thought maybe we could uh, uh, jump a bit to the third part of your book, which is actually, uh, I guess, uh, that's one of the parts that I find a bit more unusual that you usually don't find in books about architecture, because there have been a lot of questions uh, around, like, uh, you know, distinction between hands-on and different types of architects, like, where's the line? And we've talk, talked about how, you know, you have to maybe be coding or close to the developer. So there's so many aspects of it. And somebody said, oh, I feel like I need to be ingrained in the team to know what I'm doing. And there's like, um, you talk in the last part also about leadership skills, negotiation skills, all those types of uh, facets. Do you want to go a bit more into that? Why you put it in the book yeah. about architecture, yeah. not about architects? <laughs> sure. As a matter of fact, I will say, I believe that's, um, at least in my opinion, uh, it is one of the things that differentiates um, our book from other books on software architecture. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's two core differentiators. Um, uh, the first is that uh, we do span kind of the whole entire gamut of software architecture, not only the foundational aspects, uh, the architecture styles uh, that we cover eight of those, um, but also part three, which you're referring to, um, Vigeta, which is about the soft skills of architecture. And um, it, these can kind of be found in different sort of resources and stuff, but um, primarily it brings all three of those aspects of architecture kind of together in kind of a complete journey. And I think that was one differentiator of our book. And I wanna talk a little bit, a bit about that last part, but another differentiator, and this kind of leads to part three in your question, is that another differentiator of the book is that um, we really tried to focus, and I think we succeeded, uh, Neil, in making sure that nothing in the book is really theoretical, but rather pragmatic. Um, uh, pragmatic happens to be one of my favorite words in the English language. I'm dealing with things sensibly and realistically that is based on practical rather than theoretical considerations. And so what you see in the book is basically experiences that Neil and I have had over the course of 30 plus years and not collectively, but each of us, or maybe 25 plus years, um, that uh, we've learned the things that work and don't work. And that's what's actually another differentiator in the book. These are not theories that, oh, this might be a good idea to write about. No, these are practices. And that's hence um, one of the other reasons why we titled or subtitled our book, An Engineering Approach. Um, uh, but uh, the soft skills of architecture I maintain uh, is about, are about 50% um, of being a software architect. Um, we may have titles of technical architect, but I would still even say um, people skills and the facilitation, negotiation, uh, leadership um, are absolutely essential as an architect. Um, and so we've devoted a whole third of the book to uh, negotiation, leadership, how to make teams effective, um, how to make architecture decisions and all the sort of anti-patterns that emerge from actually making architecture decisions. And so it's a, uh, my opinion, it's a very powerful part of the book, but also a very necessary part of understanding not only the role of a software architect, but what software architecture is all about. And um, I wanna kind of finish, um, Brigetta, because I could talk about this for four hours, but I wanna finish um, my, my little statement here <laughs> um, by just saying how important um, these are. And I, I like to um, use this analogy and it will take just about a minute to describe this. Um, uh, let's say that, um, uh, oh, let, I got an idea. Brigetta, let's say that you are the best developer in the world and you're really, really, really good developer. And um, you just notice in your code that you've got a certain level of cyclomatic complexity and it's starting to increase. And so you step back and you look at it and go, hmm, I should use the strategy design pattern to kind of uh, reduce that cyclomatic complexity. And you do. It's perfect. And no one's going to challenge you, Brigetta, on that at all. 
However, let's say Neil over here um, is an architect and makes a decision uh, to form what's called application silos to be able to restrict access to data within our systems for security and change control and stuff. And so everybody's accessing a certain customer database, but Neil as an architect says, nope, no one can access it anymore. You got to ask me for the data. Yeah. And here's my point. Um, is anybody going to argue with Neil and challenge him? And the answer is pretty much everybody except the people who are on the customer's <laughs> uh, uh, management system. Uh, the point being, um, to bottom line this, uh, enjoy, enjoy being a developer, folks, while you can, because you have so much control over your life and your decisions. Because as an architect, everybody, pretty much, and I will say almost always, all decisions you make as an architect will be challenged. They will be challenged by other architects who have a better way or thoughts of doing it. They will be challenged by developers who think they have a better way of doing it. They'll be challenged by stakeholders who say, oh, no, 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 too expensive. It's going to take too long. And that is why these negotiation skills, the people skills, the leadership skills are, are so incredibly important as an architect. So bottom line, enjoy time you have right now as a, as a developer and enjoy that freedom of decision-making because you'll lose it as an architect. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the reasons that became such a prominent part of our book, I mean, we, so we, uh, uh, Brigitte and I both work for ThoughtWorks and we're feedback junkies. And so we've, we've been getting feedback from people we've been teaching about software architecture and from the software architecture conferences. And it's ironic that these are called soft skills in architecture because these are the most difficult parts of architecture for most, particularly new architects, because they have really good technical skills, but, you know, trying to negotiate between. So I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, you've encountered this as well, and many of you have as well, being an architect on a team with very, very strong personalities who disagree about something. And you're managing that and still making them productive and you know, that's really, really difficult. And it's not something you train for when you're learning about Kubernetes and frameworks and libraries and that kind of stuff. So we really felt that was a vital part of the role of software architecture and it's, and it's under addressed, we think. So we wanted to make sure that we addressed it uh, and we did. And also a lot of the stuff takes the, I mean, it sounds scary as well, but then there's also stuff like you talk about risk assessment and some techniques, how to do that or I always feel like writing down decision records may, makes me feel less stressed because, you know, there's, there's so much contempt also sometimes, like you said, like, oh, why did you do that? And, you know, then people kind of like uh, judge each other half a year later, right? So just writing it down makes me feel less stressed. And I think those are all like different things that can help, especially when you're in the role for the first time, like make it less scary, right? Yeah, well, that, exactly. I gets back to something we were saying before. So one of the things that Mark and I say a little bit tongue in cheek is that, uh, as an architect, you almost never achieve the best design. What you're looking for is the least worst design. Because best implies that you've maximized everything and everything is perfect. And you almost never get there, but you can get to the least worst set of trade-offs. And that's why you, you very often feel kind of crummy about decisions because it's like, well, this is, there's no way this can be best, but you know, maybe it's the least worst. And writing those things down, I think, helps come to that conclusion that, yeah, this is a, a reasonable justification for doing this because I believe the real job of an architect, the role of architecture, because when you're a developer, it's easy. It's like, huh, I don't know how Kubernetes works. So you can go buy a book, you can do an online class. There are lots of resources for all this technical stuff. When you're an architect in a big organization, big enterprise, the question comes up, should we use an enterprise service bus or should we hand roll our own message broker for this? I can't go find a book with the answer to that question in it because it's brand, it's a snowflake problem. And so your job as an architect is not to have memorized every solution on earth because you can't. Your job is to, when presented a novel situation and they're all novel, can you objectively assess the trade-offs on either side so that you can make an informed decision and move forward? And that's your best shot. And then hopefully you'll document that in an ADR uh, so that, you know, eight months from now, you can yell at yourself briefly and then move on with your life and, and redo that decision because the entire world's changed. You know, very often what people call technical debt is not that we did something wrong. It's that we did something right two years ago, but then the entire universe changed in the course of that two years and made that correct decision now incorrect. And, you know, it happens all the time and it's, it's unavoidable. Yeah. And I actually, I wanted to move on from this topic of what, an what the skills of an architect are, but there's one question that has been asked multiple times in different ways. So I would just want to put that to you. So it's like, 
what are your thoughts on architects not coding at all for many years? Or there was another question about like, do you have to have been a developer to become an architect? So maybe you can briefly say something about that. No one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you can be an architect if you haven't coded for many years and uh, you Absolutely. should have been a developer. You should have been yeah. a developer and you've got to, I mean, you lose context so fast if you get out of code. Uh, you know, you uh, uh, many developers have been the victim of uh, someone who's in an enterprise architect role who wrote some rocking good COBOL code 20 or 30 years ago, but now they're making decisions about, you know, uh, cloud resources and containers and that kind of stuff. And they, they're just completely out of their depth. So yeah. we both firmly believe uh, that you've got to have be involved in the code base at all times. And, you know, we're, uh, of course, ThoughtWorks is a big uh, pairing culture. I think the best way for architects to do that, because you never really want to be on a critical path because you're constantly being interrupted in meetings. And in fact, you should really take the bullet of some meetings away from developers if you can, so that they can stay busy doing stuff. So, uh, so pairing, selectively pairing with developers is great because it allows you to drop in when you have time in your schedule to do it. It allows you to visit each part of the code base and so get a good feel for the holistic view of what's going on. It lets you do some checks on some code quality and that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, it's, it, I think it's critical to really fully understand what's going on. And as the system evolves, you have to keep track of it. And I want to also kind of qualify this because uh, both Neil and I share a same mind on this, that staying hands-on is, is uh, critical for um, not only, uh, well, for uh, so many variety of reasons, <laughs> Birgitta. As a matter of fact, um, one of them is uh, going back to part three of our book, the whole back third of it, which is um, leadership and mentoring uh, skills. Um, without that technical aspect as an architect, it's hard to A, gain respect um, from development teams. Mm -hmm. It's hard to collaborate with development teams as well. Um, one of the things Neil and I talk about in part one of our book, which is the foundations of architecture, is something we uh, call the knowledge triangle, and it's a, a triangle of knowledge. And one of the things we talk about in the book is about um, placing your focus as an architect, um, not necessarily on technical depth. In other words, um, having to understand every aspect of a language or an API or a certain um, product or a framework or ecosystem like Kubernetes, um, but rather focus on the breadth of knowledge, um, going wider as opposed to deeper. And this is much more important for an architect to focus on. Um, so when we talk about remaining hands-on, um, do you have to be necessarily a technical expert in all these languages. And, and, and my answer to that is usually no. Um, as a matter of fact, I usually coach. It's much better to become familiar with 10 different caching technologies, for example, and know the pros and cons and trade-offs of those, rather than knowing memcache D so well you could rewrite that thing. Um, and so when we talk about being hands-on, yeah, there's so many multiple facets, you get it, in, in putting these things together about uh, having that technical prowess. Um, but again, it doesn't have to necessarily be as deep as a developer. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of facets to that. Yeah. Well, and I think that also implies that an architect should not view their role in the project as the number one gunslinger in town. I know every detail of every single thing that's happening everywhere on this project. There's just no way to do that now. There's too many. So you've got to accept specialization on a project. The, the real role of the architect is to understand holistically how does it all fit together? Because that's the thing that only the architect is really solely responsible for. So, you know, it's nice if you know the implementation details of some of these things, but it's less critical than having a firm understanding of how the pieces fit together structurally and then and defer some of that specialization to other people because, you know, as our ecosystems get more and more complex, we have to rely on specialization more and more. Uh, and that breadth becomes more and more important because understanding what the trade-offs are between these various choices becomes more critical to be successful. Yeah. Another thing that has been asked in the Q&A uh, a lot, there were multiple questions about it, is uh, the whole challenge as an architect of how do I make it evolutionary? And I guess that's especially a question that goes to Neil. So there were questions around how do I start the foundations of an architecture without knowing the full scope? And if I'm in an agile or lean environment, where the iterations, where do I fit those foundations in? How much do I do upfront? And there was also a question, which order do I read the two books, building evolutionary architecture first or 
fundamentals Actually, of software architecture. I'll answer the first. second one first. I think the fundamentals of software architecture first and then building evolution architectures because <clears throat> evolution architectures basically builds on the stuff in the fundamentals because it's you know, obviously a, a more fundamental topic. And it's a great question. And you know, a lot of this comes down to, again, context and it depends, of course, but then it depends on what. You know, I'll go back to a, a well-worn uh, analogy. If I'm going to build a doghouse out back, I can go to the hardware store and buy some wood and hammer and some nails. And I don't have to do a lot of upfront planning. I can hammer it together and, you know, the dogs are going to be pretty happy with it. Uh, similarly, if I'm building a registration system for, an, for my neighborhood school, for my kids to sign up for, you know, a school drive or something, I don't have to do a lot of architecture. I can download Ruby on Rails or a PHP application and bang together or go to Squarespace or something, bang together some little application. If I need to build a 50 story office building with four elevator towers and, you know, industrial heating and lighting, I've got to do some planning. Uh, and so <laughs> similarly on a project, a software project where I have really serious architecture characteristics, a certain level of scalability, a certain number of concurrent users I need to support, you have to have some planning to be able to build those things. It's almost impossible to retrofit something to make it scalable when it wasn't designed that way. Look at Twitter. It's a perfect example of trying to retrofit something while it's in production and make it more scalable. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. And so a lot of this has to do with how much, how little can you get away with as you go through this. So one of the things that Mark and I stress a lot in this book is the iterative nature of software architecture as well as doing development. In fact, one of the flowcharts that we show about coming up with some sort of greenfield project, you have to figure out if you have nothing, you have to figure out what components are there, kind of the coarse grain building blocks of the application. We talk about an iterative process. We actually show a flow chart there where you go through that process, but then pick up some additional considerations and go through that process again. And in fact, we model this live, even in presentations with sticky notes to, to reinforce the point that that early design needs to be ephemeral and easy to tear up and throw away and redo, but, and you need to, the ability to iterate as you go along, which finally gets to the first part of your three-part question, the evolution architecture stuff. The <laughs> Building Evolution Architecture book basically laid out the abstract principles, but mostly what it did was give you the mechanics of how to build an architecture like that. And the mechanics, of course, is this idea of a, an architectural characteristic fitness function. So something like performance, if I have a certain goal for performance in my application, if I create a fitness function solely focused on performance and run that as part of a regular build, then I know exactly what my performance characteristics are over time. And even if I make substantive changes to my code base, I still know that I have an impact at performance. And so evolution architecture is really about the mechanics of how do you iterate on architectures over time uh, but, you know, it really requires both things. You need to be able to iterate on the structure and reconsider things, uh, particularly in distributed architectures. One of the things that we talk about uh, a fair bit here and even more and the next thing we're working on is trying to get the granularity of things like services right because it requires multiple levels of iteration because there's so many dimensions that go into that decision and you need to be able to iterate on them and kind of play what if game structurally and then say, oh, well, but, you know, what about this? And so uh, iteration is, is key. I think for, I mean, that's what we learned from software development in general, and, and in particular for building evolutionary architecture. So I really think that there's a, a through line here where Kent Beck really discovered the impact of automation on software in the early 90s with XD. The operations and DevOps world rediscovered that lesson in the 2000s with the DevOps revolution and automated machine provisioning, which led us to containers and things like that. Now what I think we're doing is figuring out that things like architectural governance can also be automated. So there's a through line here of learning how to automate more and more of the nuts and bolts and mechanics of software development. I think evolution architecture is just the next step in that evolution of figuring out how to automate more and more of these critical moving pieces. And also to uh, bring it back to uh, linking our um, most recent book, <laughs> um, on page 26 um, actually has a diagram of exactly what I was talking about at the very beginning. And it looks like this, which I'm gonna to try to put this here. This is what I was describing about the collaboration that's needed uh, between an architect and uh, the development team. Uh, this on page 26, so what we describe as the collaboration of how an architect does relate to development teams um, is also uh, a critical and essential ingredient to the whole aspect of evolutionary architecture. Um, because this, what it points to, is the fact that the architect does need to be involved in the full life cycle 
of a particular project or application and even therefore beyond that life cycle. For, for, well, when I say life cycle, until, until that application disappears. <laughs> um, so it is another kind of linkage uh, to evolutionary architecture when we start talking about the, um, uh, the role of an architect um, within a team as well. Yeah, one of one of the things about the, doing things iteratively, and you also point that out uh, or recommend that in the book to always uh, figure out, is this the latest responsible moment to make this decision? Or can I just defer this decision? Maybe I don't have to take it today. And I think that's really good advice, but I very frequently get this question, but how do I know when the latest responsible moment is? And of course it depends, right? But uh, uh, if any of you have any uh, experience with that, like how to kind of get a good feeling for when I can just like wait a little bit longer to get more information? A lot of it has to do with the, what you think the consequences are. Uh, so we, we talk some about the responsibility of decisions in architecture. Mark brought one of these up before, like choosing an XML library uh, to implement parsing. Uh, you know, that has very little long-term consequences, so I don't have to worry too much about that. Choosing what persistence library we're going to use for the entire architecture has a huge implication. And so, you know, that decision has to be made with a lot more consideration. So a lot of it has to do with what we think the scope of the decision is going to be and, you know, how much we've learned because, you know, the thing we've learned in Agile is the, the longer you can successfully put it off without causing yourself headache, the more informed the decision will be uh, when you finally make that decision. And so that's, you know, that's the, the tension that you have of learning as much as you can to make a better decision, but not so long that it starts impeding your progress. So. You know, that's a, it's a very much an independence. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, this is this is really a, 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 a an art. So this is a hard part. As a matter of fact, uh, that last responsible moment uh, piece. As a matter of fact, I learned uh, last responsible moment from a book I read uh, by Colin Powell, his first book, um, My American Journey, where he actually talks about uh, the last responsible moment, uh, when to deploy troops, uh, when to pull troops back, and as a matter of fact. In that book, uh, Colin Powell actually has an equation that he leverages himself uh, to help him determine this last responsible moment. But yeah, Neil's right. One of them is about the consequences. Um, I tend to try to gauge it. And again, it, it, it just depends on the context, the urgency about uh, justifications. In other words, when I have a decision and I'm not sure I want to make it yet, uh, I look at what information I have and can I justify that particular decision, major or minor, um, with enough justification uh, that I'm comfortable enough to make it. And uh, so I, I, I and, and also, I guess the added piece of that is what factors haven't I taken into account yet? And so uh, there's a balancing act that happens with this last responsible moment, because certainly if we wait too long, um, we blow time budgets, uh, uh, everything and, and frustrate people, quite frankly, because developers are kind of sitting there saying, well, I'm just kind of waiting for you to make a decision here. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, but it is definitely a very powerful thing to, um, in a meeting, just sometimes ask, do we have to decide this now? It's sometimes like a magical question because everybody always thinks, oh no, decide, we have to decide. We have this, as humans, this need to decide, right? And it can be a very magical question in a meeting sometimes. And uh, yeah. I I would even say lead with, can't we defer this now? Hmm. That's the default, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yes. You know, a lot of uh, people uh, prefer not to say no, and, and uh, allowing them to say yes makes it easier for them. So yeah. Can't we just defer this? And they can say yes. It's like, oh, I said yes to that. So, you know, it's, I'm not disagreeing. I'm agreeing. So. <laughs> so we're almost out of time, unfortunately. There were actually a lot of very good questions, you know, but, <laughs> you know, to discuss all of them would take such a long time. A lot of them would actually be answered if you read the book. I'm not getting paid by O'Reilly, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you two are, but I'm not. Um, but uh, I have a few, like, there were a few logistical questions about the book in the beginning that maybe we can do, like, a quick fire thing to uh, end this. So one of the questions was, when is it released? It's already out, right? Then somebody asked if there was going to be an audio book. You know, I don't know. Uh, I don't, you know, we need to check. Uh, I don't know how often O'Reilly does that. It's really tricky for technical books like this because trying to describe the diagrams and audio is going to be uh, tough. It's even tougher than yeah. source code. Oh, that's true. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. Uh, that, that may be the yeah. challenge there, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, and somebody, somebody also asked about the diagram. So they were asking if um, there's a resource out there with the high res version of the pictures from the book. 
Uh, there's not, but that's a good idea. We can put one of those out there. So uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll put that out. There's a website, a companion website for the book at fundamentalsofsoftwarearchitecture.com. Uh, it's the entire name of the book all crammed together with no spaces. Uh, you know, there's a, a single global resource of names for websites. It gets smaller and smaller. The pool gets smaller all the time. So uh, that's why it's fundamentalsofsoftwarearchitecture.com. Just lucky it's not fundamentalsofsoftwarearchitecture.com by Neil Ford and Mark Richards.com. So, there you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one in 10 years will have to be fundamentals of software architecture by somebody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but, and then um, there was a, Question about oh, translations, if any translations are planned? There are translations underway right now, certainly a Chinese. In fact, one of our colleagues in China is doing a translation, which I'm very excited about because they'll do a fantastic job uh, doing a simplified Chinese uh, version and uh, several other translations are underway uh, right now as well. Yep. And uh, just to uh, yeah. um, follow up on the uh, prior question, um, Neil and I, um, we are in fact um, looking at uh, realizing some of the diagrams uh, that we have, because they're so detailed, um, tend to be very small <laughs> and hard to read. So we are uh, actually going through some of those at this time to uh, try to uh, increase the fonts of those. But um, I kind of like, uh, I kind of like that idea of maybe putting some of those ones up there that are, uh, you know, again, harder and more detailed to see in a, in a, in a book. Mm -hmm. yeah. And last uh, logistic question. And I actually just had to, uh, had to duck, duck, go this, uh, but I didn't know what M O O C meant. So massive online something course, right? So people were asking if you're going to do one of those about the book. Uh, on O'Reilly, like a multi-line. Um, massive multi open online course. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we actually do a variation of it called Architecture by Example, the, uh, the O'Reilly online learning platform. Uh, we actually do a sort of an interesting thing from the book because uh, we know a lot of people are, are like to learn things by example. So we, we take two example katas and walk through the process in the book over four hours and design architecture for them and touch on each stage of the structural part. Obviously, that's only the structural, the part two of the book, not part one and part three. Uh, but we definitely have an online class for that. And on the O'Reilly Learning Platform, we also have the seed videos that started this whole thing, which is called uh, Fundamental uh, Software Architecture Foundations. Uh, there's a second edition of, out there, and that's Mark and I talking about this subject. It's, uh, it's one iteration behind the book, uh, but it's the thing that we iterated on to create the book. So it's very closely related. Yeah. Cool. Well, um... Thanks for your time. Thanks everybody who dialed in. Yes, At some point you. we had over 600 people. So it's pretty cool. And I hope some people watch the recording as well. And yep. yeah, have a great rest of the day or yep. rest of the night, wherever people are dialed in from right now, which time zone. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Thanks very much, everyone. We appreciate your time and attention, your fantastic questions. Uh, yeah. And uh, we hope you get a copy of the book. Yep. All right. Bye.